It's an emergency. Please, quick! Is my ex-husband here? Please! Oh my God, I'm so glad you didn't try to kill me! I'm a police! I'm running away! I'm running away! Just quick! Right, just try and calm down. I'm getting police organised now. Still with me! What? Where are you? Are you indoors? I'm in the road! Where is she? She's in the back garden. No, you don't! He was in the garden with her! Right, Mum's in the garden. Is she conscious and breathing? I don't know! You don't know? Okay. What's, what's Mum's name? Jennifer. Jennifer? Jennifer Cronin. And you don't know where he is? He's on my mum's Is anyone with Mum? Oh my God, my mum's dead! It's it's my mum! Oh, she's dead! Oh my God, she's dead! Oh my God, she's dead! Oh my God, she's dead! Two people are critically ill in hospital tonight, suffering from severe burns. A man approached a woman and set her on fire before setting himself alight. Police, fire and ambulance crews are at the scene in Benfield. Eyewitnesses say they saw two helicopters, three fire engines and six police cars. The man has now been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder. You go again from the start. I didn't see fire on her, but I saw a. I did see flames, but I can't remember. I can't remember where I saw the flames. I right, can't remember okay. if I saw. I can't have seen them. I can't That's okay, sorry. So where was he then at this time when you were talking to your mother? I didn't. I didn't see him at first, but he was in that corner where we were. And what what was state was he in at the time? He was sort of smoking. So he wasn't on fire anymore, but he was still smoking. smoking. Okay. Yeah, he was burnt all the way through. And what did your mum say to you? Said, yeah, just, uh, I'm OK, I'm, I'm strong, I'll be strong, Daddy's with me. OK. I'll be OK. OK. She had no eyebrows, no eyelashes, all her hair was burnt off, all her hands were red, raw, and her face, everything was sort of black. I didn't ever think it would end that way. Not my nan. I did feel angry with my dad. I just wish something could have clicked in his head that had gone too far. I think he did it to hurt me. He knew how close I was to my mum. He knew how much we meant to each other, and I think it was the biggest way of, of hurting me. He killed my mum, and it could have been prevented. The police didn't protect us. We were shouting and screaming, waving it in their faces. And the failings were shocking. If they'd done their job properly, my mum would be here. People knew there was a problem, but no one thought it was going to go this far at any point. Especially not the police. An inquest. Jory has been asked to consider whether any errors by the state contributed to the deaths of 50 year old Kieran Lynch and Jennifer Cronin in Benfleet. Kieran Lynch poured petrol over 72 year old Jennifer Cronin and set her on fire in the garden of her home last March before doing the same to himself. The circumstances and the way that Jennifer was killed were hugely impactive. 
The purpose of an inquest is to establish how someone's died, who they were and in what the circumstances. But during that process, sometimes it will identify if we've missed opportunities. Could we have done more than we did? With any homicide case, we have to go back and try and piece together what's taken place. When I met Kieran, I was 17, 18. He was three years older, and he was a bricklayer. I was a trainee hairdresser, and he had amazing hair. He seemed to worship the ground Sue walked on, yeah. like what everybody would kind of want. He, to me, seemed like the perfect husband. My parents had a good marriage and I wanted the same. My mum really liked Kieran, really liked him, and that was very important. We wanted the same future. I knew how much he loved me. <laughs> Don't get too wet. Mummy, go berserkers. <laughs> We'd normally be seeing my nan at least twice a week. We was really close. My nan and my dad really got on on a different wavelength. They had a connection. Show me your basket. How many have you got? Seven. Seven. Quick, down the garden then. When I was younger, I thought he was an amazing dad. Hello. Hello. He's always very generous. Mummy, I've got my blue bike. Oh, look at that. helmet. That's beautiful. Put your helmet on. He would be the person that makes me and my sister laugh. It felt like we was kind of his world at that point. But he was a Jekyll and Hyde personality. He had to be the best at everything. He had to be the better cook or I felt like if he'd hoovered, I had to say how wonderful it was. Quite, quite competitive. He was definitely a little bit of a control freak. It would be him showing us and us watching. <laughs> He wanted everyone to be like perfect and he wanted it to be like a picture perfect family. He'd say that he had all this work on and he was only doing it because he had to keep up with the girls' lifestyles and the things that they wanted and what Sue wanted and how he provided for them all the time. He wanted to prove something that he didn't really have to. Mm. He put that strain on yeah. himself. He didn't cope with stress very well at all. He found it difficult to express himself, so I think it came out in, in temper. He could throw things or, or smash things or, or break something. I didn't think too much into it, but I should have done. Over time, the arguments got more aggressive. His reactions were bigger. My most vivid memory is hearing, like, the shouting, the screaming, like, plates smashing. Me and my sister, and, like, sit by the banister and just listen. And then I really started to notice that it wasn't normal. 
it was around drink. Kieran would change personality when he'd had a lot to drink. It started with the odd pushing and sort of poking into your chest. And the violence escalated over time. Gradually more force would be used. Sitting on my chest or pushing more onto my throat. We've obviously full of apology the next day and sorry, but there'd always be a reason why he lost his temper and, and did that. I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed that I didn't do anything. I was embarrassed that I'd let that happen to me. So I never really said anything to anybody. Never told my mum, never told the police. Just accepted it. Mr Lynch poured petrol over himself and 72-year-old Mrs Cronin and set them both on fire in her garden in March 2018. When we first came across Kieran in January of 2018, we, we had next to no profile of him at all. What we now know is there was a really complex history between Susan and Kieran that had, had spanned over several years before that we weren't aware of at the time. Domestic violence is one of those offences that is unreported still. If we'd have known more about Kieran leading up to the murder, it would have helped us to assess what his capability was, what his level of violence was, the level of danger. I first noticed a change in Kieran. He was doing my extension at the time. He just looked unwell, like withdrawn in the face. He'd, look, he'd lost a lot of weight. And then sometimes he didn't turn up and he'd say he had other work on. We had a joint credit card and we didn't really use it, only for that big purchase, like a TV or something. I'd open the post and he'd racked up about £3,000 on it. It was all cash withdrawals. So obviously I questioned him. He got very defensive, very aggressive, and then just stormed out the house. He'd dramatically change from one sort of person to another. What was actually going on? Some days you're walking on eggshells around him. He was a little bit more on edge. I'd picked up his work jeans to put in for washing and a little cut-up straw fell out. And I remember sort of thinking it was strange. And obviously then put my hands in the pockets to pull them out to check and found a packet of cocaine. I think that was the beginning of the road where things were really wrong. There was one time that it was just us in the house. He got really angry and he took the kitchen knife and he pushed it to my throat and held it there. He said, we'll go together, we'll end it on you first and then me, so that'll be it. It felt like it went on for hours. I was terrified. I had to protect my daughters. So we did split up. He went and lived with his parents. After we separated, I felt light, I felt relief. But I hadn't actually realised what he was capable of. Essex Police, what's your emergency? Um, I, my, my ex-husband is outside my house threatening to get in and... Um, sorry. No, no that's fine. Not, You've got uh, the right thing. the lights out of me. Yeah, I can imagine. Oh, he's got a hammer. He's got a hammer, no, OK. He's got a big He could smash the door. The 
Got opinions? Great. We want to know what Scotland thinks. Join Scott Pulse to complete short surveys, have your say and win cash prizes. Kieran Lynch set himself and his mother-in-law, Jennifer Cronin, on fire. The 50-year-old had been locked in a bitter divorce with his wife, Susan, who repeatedly warned the authorities about his drug fueled threatening behaviour. Essex Coast Control Room. There was an incident at Toy Spring Road, incident 311, I think it is. It was the uh, lady and the, the, the man who got set alight yesterday. I was only there a few days ago and she was telling me what was going on. What did she say to you? She just explained to me that her daughter was uh, divorcing her son-in-law. Her words were, he's become erratic and scary and that she was frightened because, well, her words were, you never know. That was our last conversation. I needed to do it officially, needed to get a divorce underway. I was very nervous to see him because he was volatile. He needed to know I'd moved on and things had changed. I'd met somebody that I wanted to be with. I said, I want to get a divorce and he agreed. I thought it had gone quite well and it was amicable. But I was wrong. I'd met a girl that I really liked. We started slowly and then as time goes by and you get more comfortable with each other and, and you open up a little bit more, you know, Sue started to tell me about Kieran. It wasn't a nice situation, but I didn't know the full extent of the story. And I guess he didn't like me and Sue being together. Yeah, we're on our way. Stand the phone with me. We're on our way, okay? okay? Oh, he's got something. He's got a. He's, what's he got? He's got a hammer. He's got a hammer. Yeah, he's got a big sledgehammer. Oh, he's smashing up all my pots outside. There's been a lot of abuse and, and violence before, so I'm sorry. Right, can you go to the bathroom and lock yourself in? I can't. There's no lock on it. Okay. Is there any room you can go to lock yourself in? No, I haven't got any locks because I've got okay. children. Okay. Are there children in the property now? No, no, just me and my dog. Okay. 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 So we're trying to get units allocated to you, okay? Yeah. We could smash the doors. Smash the windows, you'll be in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to stand the line with you so you can see him, all right? Okay. The police handcuffed him and arrested him. He was heard saying that he wanted me dead. Kieran was initially arrested for three offences, uh, criminal damage, possession of offensive weapon and making threats to kill. And the Crown Prosecution Service thought criminal damage was more appropriate charge. I was petrified. He threatened to kill me. 
Susan said that she'd received a text message from Kieran that said, sorry, but I'd rather have you killed. You could argue that text message was hypothetical. Kieran was a builder, so he had a hammer in his car. But to have evidence to charge for that offence, you have to not have lawful authority to be possessing that at that time. Kieran didn't have previous convictions, and we kind of saw this as a domestic breakup. Having been charged with criminal damage, he was released with conditions not to have contact with Susan and not to go into the road where she lived. They charged Kieran with criminal damage, which was a farce. I couldn't quite believe that's what they charged him with. I'd never felt scared before, and that was the time that I started to feel a little bit scared. I don't think the police took any of our fears seriously at all. I just don't get how they could be so careless. Essex Police, what's your emergency? Hello. Yeah, uh, uh, it's an odd, odd request, but um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at a week's end. I, uh, I really don't know where I am or what to do. Uh, so, so you lost, are you, or...? No, no, I'm not, I'm not lost. <laughs> Just lost in life, I think. Right. Uh, uh, I've tried mm. to... Uh, okay. uh, All right, well, where are you? Uh, lobster smack. I've been arrested for the first time in my life for criminal damage and various things. Uh, I'm going for a, a criminal risky divorce. Uh, right. Have you done anything today at all, or...? In, in what respect? Anything against yourself? Uh, I've, I've tried to. Alright, oh, what have you tried to do? No, I've just tried to kill myself, but... Okay. <laughs> I've driven to a place that I know quite well. Tried to put a plastic bag over my head for the yeah. belt. Alright. Oh, Round my neck, and, uh I just can't, can't take, take me. Kieran, you still there? Kieran? It was a cry for help from him, so we did deploy police officers and the mental health triage team to attend, speak to him. He was responsive in his, in, in his answers. He had no uh, indication that he wanted to, to kill himself at that point. We can only base upon what somebody tells us and the way that they're behaving at the time. He told them he was absolutely fine. They said that the most appropriate thing was be for him to contact his GP. We didn't feel that there was any further requirement for any other medical care in terms of his mental health. our conditions were that he wasn't ever to make contact with me. But he just was not going away. She still had to go back to that house every day and he didn't care about restraining orders. She was scared of what was going to become of her. She was scared of when he was going to show up next. He was spreading rumours that I'd been sending him text messages along the lines of... I'm breaking bedposts with your ex-wife. And he told a number of people that. He was obsessed with about Mike. His registration plate. What are you going to do with that? It's just the not knowing, isn't it? He'd created his own world in his head. He was on a totally different planet. A 
if it's birth control, I'm not going to help you. Right, I have he's on bail at the moment, but he's broken bail conditions by contacting me. He's saying he's got nothing here, nothing to stay for. I'm a bit concerned about his state of mind because it's just all a little bit loopy loose. So I don't know if he's going to harm himself or harm the girl because he did threaten to kill me. So I don't know what his state of mind is like. I've got all of his bail conditions. I send it over to local officers. Okay, I mean, just, I'm frightened of him. I don't think he's mentally stable. I recall her phoning and explaining every single incident that had happened before just to let them know who she was. And it would always be, oh, well, sorry, I wasn't on that day or I wasn't... You know, and it's a bit... What are the police actually doing in all this? Nothing. To me, it seemed like nothing. My mum asked me had I been round the garden to top the pond up because the hose was out and I knew I hadn't. It did make me think that Kieran had done that. Like a torment, like a tease to let us know that he was just around. My mum got frightened. Well, it was just too much for an older lady, just too much for her to cope with. It was scary. Put shivers down my spine. I had a phone call from Mike. He could see this person going into the garage. That had to be a Kieran. I went upstairs to look at him out of one of the bedroom windows. It, it was spooky. I hide him behind the curtain, not knowing what he was going to do next. And then pitch black. Kieran had switched all the electrics off. He just come out of the garage and drove off. It felt really frightening. I told the police, but he wasn't being arrested. He was out somewhere and nobody knew where he was. My nan is just like the bright, bubbly woman, always the most glamorous woman in the room. The police had actually done their job. My nan would still be here. I just don't get what went so wrong. Kieran was on a rampage of threat and terror. I just felt he could be there at any time. And then he started calling. It was getting worse and worse. He'd been contacting Sue an unbelievable amount of times. My mum would pick it up, put it down, he'd call again, pick it up, put it down. I was petrified, but police weren't doing anything. You're just thinking, get out there, just just find him, just get hold of him, just do something. We were told that he would be arrested, but it wasn't being followed up. Susan contacted us again in March and said that she'd received further calls and messages from Kieran. On a daily basis, we have a number of crimes that we have to deal with, and we assess each and every one of them. There were no direct threats from Kieran, no suggestion that he was going to go to the dress. We saw that in isolation as not particularly risky towards Susan or anyone else. Therefore, we didn't deploy staff at that point. I would say, in hindsight, we didn't identify what this was. That fixation that's obsessive, it's unwanted, it's repeated, this was stalking. 
Stalking is one of those offences that can be hidden amongst a variety of circumstances. However, at the time, we didn't realise that he was demonstrating a course of behaviour that would cause us as a police force to be concerned, because sometimes stalking behaviour can lead to, to homicides. daughter picked up the house phone. She said at the police, they're out looking for you now. And I think he just laughed. <laughs> he said to her he was going to fuck her up. It was the first time that he threatened her. To hear him say those words to his own daughter that I knew he loved, I was horrified and frightened. Essex Police, what is your emergency? My dad keeps on threatening that he's going to come to the house and he, he's ringing up the phone, he's like harassing us all the time. What's he stated that he's going to do? Um, he, he just says he's going to fuck us up, he said he's going to kill us, he's told my mum okay. he's going to kill us. He's arresting my nan. My nan's elderly. He's like breathing down the phone to her. We've already reported it, but he's not been arrested, but he keeps on coming outside our house. Okay. We made sure that he was wanted on our police national computer. We did attend Kieran's home address. The purpose of the visit was to try and arrest him. Unfortunately, he wasn't there. I think we could have done more. The police advised the girls that they shouldn't be at our house that night. Matilda went to her best friend to stay and my oldest daughter went to stay with my mum. We were told later on that put my mum and my daughter straight into the lion's den. My daughter said as soon as the lights went off, the phone started ringing. And it didn't stop. Between the two houses, we never slept at all. My daughter said that she felt the presence, she felt like her dad was outside watching them. Hello, Essex Police Emergency. My husband, he's constantly calling the house all the way through the night. He's doing it to my mum where my daughter is staying. Did you say that there's a warrant out for him? Yeah, I've got sheet after sheet where I sat with the police and every time I'm told that they're looking for him. So I am more worried about my mum and my daughter because they're two women on their own. I'm at my grandmother's now, so he's ringing my grandmother's. The house is quite a big house and I'm just like looking around and I don't know if he's in it. I'm absolutely petrified. Is he leaving any voicemails? He left the voice and I think he's going to be joining my granddad soon. My granddad passed away last year. Right. I said, I hope we'll sleep well. We'll all see you in tea. Right, OK. He ran up to them and I said, police are going to catch you. And he said, the police haven't caught me yet. You let them see if they can find me. Although those messages were clearly very threatening, unfortunately, due to other kind of competing demands that evening we didn't have a, a unit available right at that time to, to respond to that it is a difficult task to try and juggle those resources available to us particularly overnight 
There can be so many high-risk cases in such a short space of time that we do just run out of police officers to be able to, to respond accordingly. County's weather, the last of any lingering overnight rain, will clear away as we head through the rest of this morning, with a few brighter spells but the odd afternoon shower. I remember waking up to a text from him. Which I never replied to. So I was just angry. It was 7.29 in the morning on the 13th, the case was re-risk assessed and it was declared that it was now medium risk rather than high. Medium risk cases are where there is still a potential risk of serious harm, but that risk might not be imminent. There had been a breakup and obviously Kieran was taking it extremely badly. It was just dealt with as domestic breakup. In hindsight, that was the wrong decision and, and it should have remained high. So his eldest daughter was there. He waited for her to leave. He would have known that Sue was going to come round that day. Because he knew she dropped the dog off there all those times. Uh -huh. In the morning, just needed to be with my mum and make sure she was OK. She was really frightened. She'd locked herself in her bedroom. She needed encouraging to get up, get dressed. I told her we weren't going to let him bully us, let him control our lives. My mum went out into the garden. I was watching her through the window and sort of smiling to myself that my mum was chatting away to the dog. I was on the phone to the man that Kieran had been working for. I wanted to know where he was. And in that split second... She spoke to me. She just said how much she loved me and that I was um, her world and the girls were her world. And that she was going to go and be with my dad. 
Hang in there, Mum, all right? I, I, you're not ready to go. You're not leaving me. Right? Please, don't leave me alone. What's happening to Kieran? He's in the garden. He's burning to death in the corner of the garden. Kieran was red, raw. He was gasping for breath. It was horrific. He had um, 97% burns. Never imagined this is how it would end. Regardless what he'd done, my dad was about to die. Like, I needed to say goodbye to him. I was just trying to tell him everything that I could, just tell him how much I love him. And I wish he didn't feel the way he did. He was completely wrapped up. I think, like, the only thing I could see was, like, the tip of his nose that was just completely black and burnt off. It got to that point and I just feel so... <laughs> I've, I just can't imagine thinking that was the resolution in that situation. Because she had spoken to me on the patio, I thought she would get better. I never knew the extent of burns, how gradually um, that eats away at your body. I never took it on board. It's, it's really sad, really awful, but I didn't want her to have to fight. I wanted her to go and be with my dad. My mum survived 17 days in hospital. She passed away with us all there. Just held her hands and just watched her take her last breath. So she wasn't alone. <laughs> A senior Essex police officer says the force is reviewing its procedures after being criticised over the horrific deaths of 72-year-old Jennifer Cronin and her 50-year-old son-in-law, Kieran Lynch, in Benfleet. The coroner is to compile a report into their deaths after highlighting issues with communication and record-keeping. I went in to increased angry just at Kieran at what he did, but learning the facts... I'm more angry with the police than I am with Kieran. I'm not going to sit here and hide from the fact that we, we did make mistakes. Had we identified as potential stalking, that would have been definitely more protection that we could have put in place for Susan and subsequently Jennifer. Kieran was clearly suffering in terms of his mental health around that time. We should have looked at that escalating behaviour from him. We missed opportunities to apprehend him, which could have possibly prevented what happened to Jennifer. I know that Susan's got to live with this for the rest of her life. Well, we are really sorry for what happened. I trusted the police. I thought they would always catch up with him. They would stop him. I've read in the paper, like everybody else, we could have kept Mrs Cronin and the family safer, but I've never had a face-to-face -face apology ever. We did take it seriously, but probably not seriously enough. We've learned huge amounts from, from that incident and transformed the way that we 
deal with domestic and the way that we deal with stalking cases. We're doing everything we can to prevent this from happening again. Sue so can often, um, in the middle of the night, scream, cry. She quite often will have flashbacks. You know, my girls have gone through so much and they've got to live with that forever. That Their dad was, is, was a murderer. I know what he done still stands. He done what he done. I'm not ignorant, but it's hard when people say to me, like, how can you love your dad after that? There's so many times you think, oh, I'll just tell my mum that, or I just want to ask my mum's advice on this, or you just need your mum, and I haven't got that. I miss her every day. 